Hello there, viewers, and welcome to a new segment that I am calling What Could Have Been. In the process of making a movie, many elements are left on the cutting room floor in an effort to improve the overall film. Some of these cut elements are made available as bonus features on a movie's DVD or Blu-ray as deleted scenes. In this segment, I'm going to analyze the positive and negative impact that these deleted scenes could have had on the movie if they were left in the final cut. And for my first case in this department, I'm going to tackle a movie that I've looked at before. Aragon. If you'd like to hear my thoughts on the movie itself, I'll leave the link to my review in the description below. Now before we begin, plot dump. Aragon is a farm boy living in the land of Alagasia who comes across a mysterious stone that turns out to be a dragon's egg. Joining up with local storyteller Brom, Aragon embarks on an adventure to face his destiny, train to fight and use magic like the legendary dragon riders, and save Alagasia from its tyrannical king. Galbatorix, a dragon rider turned bad. Scene 1, The Butcher's Daughter. When Aragon tells Sloane, the butcher, about the stone he found in the spine, Sloane becomes immediately worried of the king's retribution. Sloane's daughter, Katrina, a friend to Aragon, manages to sneak him a slab of meat before they share a conversation. First off, we have to remember that Aragon is the first in a series of four books, meaning that this movie could have spawned a franchise. While Katrina's role in the story wasn't earth-shattering, she was important enough to warrant inclusion of some kind even though every single one of her scenes was cut from the final movie, but we'll discuss that later. The interaction between her and Aragon is a nice touch, as her desire to see more of the world than her small hometown gives us an idea of what kind of environment the two live in. If he had his way, I'd be the faithful butcher's apprentice in the rest of my life. Also, the friendly disposition shared between them gives Aragon another element that would make him regret having to leave home. The world is much bigger than Kavo. Katrina! Give my best to your family. Without this second half of the scene, the final cut tells us Aragon left the butcher shop when he was told. When presented the stone, Sloane is shown to panic. You put it back then. It belongs to the king. Tell no one you have it. That provides a good moment of tension, a feeling that sticks with the audience better when the scene ends there and Katrina doesn't show up at all. And you know what? That feeling could have been made even stronger if It Belongs to the King was new information to the audience, rather than being told to us at the beginning through Brahm's narration. An ally of the Varden rides for her life, carrying a stone stolen from the King himself. As for how Sloane knew the stone belonged to the King, that's a different anomaly of logic altogether. Scene 2. Sibling Rivalry and No Charity Aragon has a playful bout with his cousin Rorin, which is in the final cut of the movie. An extension is given to this scene when Aragon presents the meat given to him by Katrina to his uncle, who isn't pleased with the idea of taking handouts. Aragon's uncle, Garo, isn't given a lot of personality in the final cut of the film. This scene serves to establish him as an honest man who believes in working hard to earn one's keep. Aragon, we don't take charity. I just thought that we'll just have to pay him back. Further, Roran hints at a little more going on between Aragon and Katrina than just friendship. Katrina gave it to me. <laughs> of course she did. Lastly, we're introduced to Roran in this scene, see him roughhousing with Aragon a bit, and then we immediately cut to a scene after that where Roran tells Aragon that he's leaving Carvajal to avoid being recruited into the king's army. If we had the bit with Garrow in between this and that, the mood whiplash of those two moments might not have been so jarring. And yet? As it's cut, I think the mood whiplash is more effective for the sake of the scenes that follow. We see a glimpse of the happy family shortly before they are unfortunately forced apart. Far too quickly, I feel I should point out. In the final cut of this movie, the pacing of these moments is way too fast. That said, this sadness covers a couple minutes of the movie, enough that you understand the kind of loss that Aragon is going through. And you should consider this. If these scenes weren't cut, we'd have a whole other mess of problems to deal with. Which brings us to scene three. Scene three, Rorin and Katrina. 
Aragon goes to town to see Roranoth, but it turns out he's not leaving alone. Katrina! Yeah, that's kind of a bummer. Although it never should have been. In the books, Roran and Katrina were always an item, and Aragon knew this, and as such, never harbored any feelings like this for Katrina. The scene plays out the same way as it did in the final cut, albeit with the addition of Katrina. But as Aragon leaves, he is approached by Sloane, who has suddenly decided that he wants the stone that Aragon offered him, likely because he wants a reward of some kind. Regarding the bit about Sloane, the preceding circumstances have put Aragon in a mood of questionable emotion right before Sloane comes up to him asking about the stone. Sloane tries to suck up to Aragon by offering to accept the stone as trade for meat. I've spoken with a few people and, well, it may have some value. And after being made to feel inferior in the butcher shop, now Aragon gets to throw it back into Sloane's face. I'll put it back, as you told me. Tell me where. Maybe with a lamb shank or two. Maybe even a side of beef. I don't know. It was dark. Now, back to the beginning of the scene. With his cousin leaving town and his uncle dying a few days later, Aragon essentially loses everything that he associates with home after he finds the dragon egg. And this loss could have been compounded further if the scenes with Katrina were kept. The sadness meant to be expressed about Roran leaving Carvajal is made complicated when he starts making out with the girl Aragon supposedly has a crush on. And like I said before, hinting that Aragon has a crush on Katrina at all doesn't make sense. The conversation with Sloane can't fit here either, because it depends on Katrina's presence to make things uncomfortable and trigger the state of mind with which he speaks to Sloane. Also, speaking sequentially, the egg doesn't hatch until this scene is over. Personally, I think this conversation could have worked, if they shot it to take place after the egg had already hatched. Aragon would be in a happier state of mind, and thus more confident in himself. A character spiting an unpleasant acquaintance out of confidence is much more satisfying and cathartic for an audience than if this character were to do the same thing with an air of jealousy preceding it. Scene 4. Milking the Cow Assuming I've got the scene placement right, Aragon leaves the freshly hatched dragon to tend to his chores. Uncle Garo makes a quip, cow's got attitude, Aragon makes a quip in return. There is so little to this scene, I can summarize it in two sentences. On the one hand, it's good for chuckles. We do have a cow. Some mornings we even get milk from it. You got a problem too? On the other hand, it adds nothing to the story, which makes this scene with a cow utterly pointless. By the way, I'm not waiting for a rim shot. I'm not proud of myself for making that joke. Aye, puns. Moving on then. Scene 5, The Sword of a Rider. Skipping much further ahead in the movie, when Murtog is guiding Aragon to the Barden, Murtog picks up Aragon's sword, Zarok, to admire it a bit. I've never held the sword of a rider before. As far as moments of personality go, this is a pretty good one for Murtog. A little on the side of being aloof, but also out for his own needs and desires. Ah, oh, I can get used to this. Don't. Also, he just seems to be getting a kick out of swinging that sword around. I confess myself a victim to the same attraction. This moment also shows Murtog as a good foil for Aragon, who has had to start taking more control of his destiny after the loss of his mentor, Brawn. We can learn a lot from each other. You could teach me the secret skills of the Dragon Rider. What can I learn from you? The art of staying alive. This might sound like the boring answer, but honestly, it just feels like there's no place to put this scene. The film has Murtog showing up to tell Aragon that he knows how to get to the Varden, them riding horses, and them arriving in the mountains. None of the available footage, deleted or otherwise, meshes with this scene well enough for them to slip it in without unnecessarily holding the film up and just having it feel like a distraction. Scene 6. The Twins this takes place after Murtog is taken into custody for being the son of Morzan, one of the dragon riders who joined Galbatorix. Aragon's mind is inspected by two magic-wielding twins for signs of treachery. 
We must inspect your mind for darker motives. The purpose served by these two characters is a safeguard for the Varn against any who would betray them. The twins also played a key role in the second book in the series, Eldest, which was never adapted into a movie. For the purpose of this movie, they give perspective on why such methods are necessary. There's no other way. Our lives turn on a single betrayal. As well as open another avenue into the mind, which becomes an important battleground in future stories. Have you made a pact with the king? How do you summon the dragon's magic? Comes from dragons. Sphira, help me. Assuming this movie would get a sequel, it would have been a good idea to leave this part in. I'll start with a nitpick. Enough! The writer has passed his test. We strongly protest. Would you mind showing the strength of your protest with a little more emotion? On a more substantial note, Ajihad, the leader of the Varden, interrupts the test to declare Aragorn has passed. If the twins are the ones you trust to probe mines for treachery, whether or not Aragorn has passed should be their call. Scene 7. The Blessing. A recently orphaned baby is presented to Aragorn. The caretaker insists that Aragorn bestow a blessing upon it, so he does. The result is underwhelming. <laughs> Throughout the film, Aragorn has had to deal with being told that he's not living up to people's expectations of a dragon rider. When word spread of a new dragon rider, we were expecting someone who was more, well, more than me. As well as dealing with the limits of his power. To put it simply, the guy's got confidence issues, and bestowing this blessing doesn't leave enough of an impression to help him much. In conclusion, this scene serves as a good demonstration of this struggle Aragorn is having to have faith in his own abilities, and could transition well into this part from the final cut. More than me. I've heard it before. Bless her. Dragon Rider, bless her. In addition, it is shown in the following books that his blessing has a strong impact on this baby. Hmm. It serves Aragorn's state of mind well, it foreshadows a character for a potential sequel, and it meshes with what's already in the movie. I'd say there's no cons to this scene. I'll drink to that. Yeah! And those are the deleted scenes from the movie Aragorn. In summary, the scenes featuring Katrina have a few interesting elements in them that might have added a new layer in a couple of places. However, the way they are structured, the inclusion of one almost demands the inclusion of the other ones. Ultimately, the emotion of the movie's first act is stronger without them, and the scene with the cow is 100% non-essential. If I had to pick any of these scenes to be included in the final cut of the movie, the two extra scenes in the Varden are good candidates. These scenes introduce characters and concepts that will receive further development and play bigger roles in the following story. Kind of a moot point to keep making that argument, though. This movie came out 10 years ago, and I'm not sure there's a strong desire to give it a second chance at adaptation. But if they ever do, it needs to be done on a larger scale so the more complex story elements can shine. And it needs to cast real little people to play its dwarf characters. I mean, for real. This is the Dwarf King. You have to do much better than that. And with that, my first episode of What Could Have Been is complete. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you feel somewhere in the middle? Whatever your thoughts are, please leave them in the comment section below. And if you want to see more episodes like this, give this video a like and let me know what movies you want me to cover. You can tell me them in the comments, or you can email me at plot-detectivesteve at hotmail.com. I am Detective Steve, and thank you for watching. Cheers.